In this video, Michael and I discuss the components of latency in FPV. We take a deep dive into filter latency and phase delay and address the issue of why too much filtering can be a really bad thing. Specifically, how adding just a few milliseconds of filter latency can result in really poor flight performance, prop wash, and other oscillations. She got the DJI goggles here. <laughs> Speaking of latency, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a feedback loop here. Input, we, something happens, output. You can think about this two ways. So if you're reacting to something, for example, then this would be your input. You could say your camera on your drone is the input and the mm -hmm. signal comes through, takes some time to get through here, then it goes through your brain, takes some time, travels down your spinal cord to your fingers, and then your fingers push that. I, I don't think of the, the latency experience we see that way. I think of it the rever reverse way, where you're always the driver, you know. So because you're pushing the stick and you're expecting something to happen in your goggles, I always think that it's best to think of latency from this end, starting here to there. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you, you move the stick, there's a bunch of things that happen, mm -hmm. and then at some point you see a change. Some people call this the end-to-end -end latency, depending on how you want to view it. But okay. I, I think of that as the sort of critical latency that, that's behind the experience you have when you're flying. Because you're, you're cruising along, the horizon is level, then you roll right, and the horizon tips left. And so there's a bunch of components that I wanted to, to discuss that are part of that. The receiver and the transmitter are going to play some role in the first part of this latency. So depending on what kind of uh, system you're using, like Crossfire, Express LRS, whatever, they're all going to have different latency. But let's just say for, for the sake of simplicity, uh, let's just give this a number of, say, 10. And then of course, rates. A lot of people don't think about this as being a component of the experience of latency that you have. But certainly around, depending on how you have your center stick, this is going to play a big role in your experience of latency. So I threw in a number here, 20, whatever. Um, your copter response. So it, it, it takes some time for the propellers to actually generate some thrust to actually move the copter. And things like P and feed forward will play into this. So that's 15 milliseconds. Okay. I'm just choosing 15 milliseconds, partly because I'm thinking about the response that I see often from set point to gyro. So that would be your set point signal to the point mm -hmm. where the copter actually changes motion. Okay. So um, this is all together with um, the gyro latency, with filter latency, software filters. There's the filter. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, ta I tack on some filter latency here. To, I mean, this is just a random number, but let's just say for for simplicity that the filter latency is not really contributing much to your experience of latency. We can debate that, but it's this is a pretty high number, really. We, you know, this is, uh, okay. but but it, you know, it does contribute to the overall uh, response. Mm -hmm. So it would it would go into this. For for my understanding, why is not the filter phase delay? before the copter response, before the pit loop? Oh, uh, yeah, probably doesn't matter. You're probably right. That could go before as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay, it's just, okay, I understand. Yeah. It's just to sum it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and of course, then finally, is your cam and camera and goggle latency. And I'm again, I'm throwing in just some random number here. I've seen some that are claiming that down as low as four milliseconds. I don't think that's very true, but, but certainly, you know, um, this this is going to be pretty variable so you got all these factors that's before the signal exits this glass and of course the, the other thing is now it has to go into the brain <laughs> and that's then that takes it that has its own whole bunch of latencies right and um um you know this is my area of, of research so like there's 50 milliseconds before a light actually sh shows any signal in primary visual cortex then mm -hmm. the signal has to make its way up to motor cortex. There's going to be some decision processes that take place that's going to slow things down, and then down the brainstem it goes, and your finger, or mm -hmm. or or you experience actually. More importantly, here is not so much that this will be the next movement per se, but um, your experience of that latency is going to be also. This is going to add to it basically. So, so do you think we can ever? Uh Fight proper with our sticks input, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> How fast would the brain need to be? It, it, would, <laughs> it wouldn't matter be, because the copter can only respond so fast. So even if you could move the sticks faster, it's, the problem is not you. you it's, it's, the, uh, it's the copter response. Mm. Well, in matter of frequency, what would be the, the fastest response time for a human? Um, what? Manual reaction time. Yes. So if, this, is, this is opposite to what we're looking at here, right? <laughs> But this is sort of asking when do we perceive a change. Uh, when you talk about reaction times, that's, that goes reverse. So what we do in those kinds of experiments is you present a stimulus into the eyes, light of some sort, and then you have to react to it depending on some condition, right? And so in that case, those kinds of reaction times for hand movements are in the range of two to 300 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But if you have to make a decision, do I go right or do I go left? Do I press the red button or the green button? You know, you have to, to make some decision. Then you start including uh, processes going on in frontal cortex that have to inform when to let this signal go downstream and cause you to click the mm -hmm. button. So. That, that See, can go way we up. We just then. learned in the, the aviation uh, the pilot training that it takes about two seconds to react on something. Uh, that's it sounds, for me, it sounds a little bit a, a lot. That's actually. a lot. Two seconds is long enough for, let's just say a signal comes in here. It's here in 50 milliseconds. Temporal cortex is where you're going to perceive objects. So by the time it gets there, it's about 100 milliseconds or so. You'll see activity in neurons here. Um, you'll see activity in, in this is what we call the dorsal stream. All the, all of these neurons in this pathway going up to motor cortex are like in the range of 60 milliseconds for the neurons to respond to light. Mm -hmm. And then it's the, all of the delay comes in. If you're talking two seconds, all of that delay is in decisions. So it could be that you're, you're flying and you had to make a complex decision. Yeah, certainly that's going to take a long time then before you, you know. But we're not, I mean, some of that exists in, in the kind of thing we're doing with, with flying and stuff because you're, you're cruising through some trees or obstacles and you have to make split-second decisions. So you're, you're, you're certainly taking in a lot of complicated information to do that. That can be slowing things down. But, mm -hmm. but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking okay. about the time that we experience the horizon change when you just move the sticks. That's what mm -hmm. we're talking about when we're saying, oh, I can experience that latency. Or when someone says, oh, it feels funny. I don't like the feel of these, of the rates. And when people are talking about feel, flight feel, it's really funny because often they say, oh, I don't like the stick feel. Well, it's not like you change the springs on your radio. Your thumbs are not feeling anything different. Don't think of it as a tactile thing. Tactile meaning that your, your mm -hmm. senses in your hand. Your hand senses are, are not experiencing You're, it's nothing just changing. It doesn't matter whether you're running beta flight or all of that's the same. You have to remember that what you're experiencing is just the relationship between when you move that to when you see something happen here. So the time to see and comprehend the change is the longest in comparison to the technical latency. Yeah, for sure. Most of the latency is all happening in here. It's actually, I've, I've heard it said that actually our experience of the world is, is lags by about 50 to 100 milliseconds. So everything that we think, we think we're looking at things in real time, but actually, and our brain tricks us, right, to make us think that it's all happening in real time. But, but actually, it's like my experience of it is about 100 milliseconds behind. Interesting so, thought, actually. Um, never, well, it's, it's, it's uh, obvious, but um, never thought of that before. Interesting. Yeah, so, well, I wanted to get into these components and just, just mm -hmm. talk a little bit about them. So let's just yep. take the first one again now. So the RXTX, this is a courtesy of UAV Tech. I'm saying that I, I, I just stole it from his, his site. But basically, it just shows you the difference in latency of all of these different systems, Ghost and Express LRS. So there's quite a bit of variability coming into all these rigs. What else have we got here? Okay, this is interesting. So, as I was saying about rates, so let's just take this example. Imagine, for example, to, uh, moving the stick from center to right roll. And in this case, we have slow, slow rates. And in this case, we have faster rates. But per unit distance, if you just pick some, some unit distance, in this case, I'm just choosing 10 millimeters, because the rates are faster here. Yeah. Your, your experience of latency is going to be a lot shorter here because... 
because you're basically reaching the same degrees per second uh, in a much shorter time. Mm -hmm. Right. With a higher rate, a lot more happens or faster it happens. There's a trade-off there between, you know, the more of the stick you're using, right? If you're using a full range and you like to be always like all over the place with the stick, then um, there's going to be a cost to that. Because if you're far right and you got to go far left, it's going to mm -hmm. take time for your thumb to get over there. It's yeah. a long ways to go. Just the, the, just the latency of the thumb then. That's exactly what this is. You have more distance to travel. And so if you're already rolled far right and you and you see a tree coming at you and you need to roll far left, if you mm -hmm. if you're if you're using really slow rates, then <laughs> then you've yeah, got a you lot you've got to travel two, 20 uh -huh. millimeters. If you yeah. had really this high also rates, takes time. It takes time. Yep. You have to accelerate the stick and also this acceleration until whatever your point you want to reach, it also takes a little That's time. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's mm. right. So yeah. So Not understood. Do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I wanted to say one more thing was that if you if you have really high rates though. I find it's easier to detect latencies elsewhere in the system. Mm -hmm. So if you had a really laggy RX signal, say you were up at about 50 milliseconds, uh, you'd really notice that lag if you had the rates really high here, as opposed to if you had the late rates really low here. It's harder for you to detect latency elsewhere in the system if your latency mm -hmm. is slow mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I would probably notice the difference between 50 hertz or 250 hertz crossfire if I were running faster rates, I'd be able to detect that that uh, difference easier. Okay, uh, response latency. So this one's easy enough. So we know what that is. It's basically the time between set points. So here I'm just showing a trace from uh, black box log, and the red is set point, and the blue is gyro. So when we're talking about the counter response, we're literally just talking about that difference. So I'm just estimating this peak to peak here is about 16 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Voila, that was the number I put in, yeah. or 15 or something. So yeah. that is pretty common, 15. actually. Somewhere between 12 and 15 is, is pretty common uh, response. Um, and next is filter latency. So what I'm showing here now is pre-filtered gyro in yellow, and mm -hmm. the blue is the post-filtered. So you know this is a pretty subtle difference, and it's quite hard to measure this latency. Anyway, yeah, so you can look at this latency in here, for example, it's about 4 milliseconds. And of course, your goggle latency. I won't go into that, but like I said, there's there's a lot of variability that's been measured by different guys out there that that do this really well. And uh, okay, now the fun stuff. When we, when we talk about phase delay, what we're talking about is converting time into phase. So this is just a plot showing how uh, a sine wave pattern can be represented by degrees. So so 360 degrees represents one full sine wave. Okay. 180 would mean that the f that the phase is exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite, right? And and 360 would mean it's just shifted one one phase, it's one complete. Three, 360 phase. is shifted one complete, exactly. Yeah. So actually, and it would it would look if you actually had a if you had a gyro signal filtered and pre-filtered that was shifted by 360 degrees, they'd sit right on top of one another and still mm -hmm. look right. But you'd know that in reality they'd be shifted in time, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's useful to kind of do this conversion. So it, this is another example here um, where the, 90%, the dash okay. curve is 90 degrees at a phase with the yellow. Mm -hmm. So the, while the yellow is up at 90, it's at zero here, right? I just wanted to show you how you can compute that. It's quite easy. So when we see filter latency in PID Toolbox or UAV Tech's filter calc tool, Mm -hmm. then you'll see that in milliseconds. That's when you want phase de delay in degrees, you have to convert it to a specific frequency of interest because it's going to be different depending on the frequency. Let's take 50 hertz, for example. Divide 1,000 by 50 to get this converted to milliseconds, and then we're just dividing milliseconds over milliseconds, and the reason for that is to get that proportion. So let's say our filter latency is 5 milliseconds, and then our full cycle latency at 50 hertz is 20 milliseconds, then 5 divided by 20 is 0.25. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to multiply that by 360 to give us how much that is in degrees. Mm. And that tells us our delay. So in this case, the example I'm using is 2.5 at 50 hertz, so 2.5 
1050 times 360 is 45 degrees. So that's that 45 degree shift here. Okay. Uh, um, two questions. The, the one the one thing you already uh, stated here, why is the 50 hertz so important? That's where you tend to see oscillations and uh, prop wash. Usually prop wash is a little bit lower than this, but 50 just is just easy to compute. Mm -hmm. It's probably closer to 40 hertz for five inch copter. Yeah, prop so it wash depends range. on the size of the copter. Yeah. But anyway, you know, we, we obviously we can't, we can actually plot all of the frequencies, but we don't want to know too much. I don't really care what the phase delay is at 200 hertz. It could be completely 300, you know, it could be 180 degrees at a phase or more up there with just two, two and a half milliseconds. And it likely mm -hmm. is like we can do that math. Let's just do it. Let's say we have five milliseconds of latency. Divided by, and let's look at 200 hertz times 360 oh yeah 360 degrees there you go you're a complete yeah. there you go. A, at 200 hertz you're actually 360 degrees at a phase a of complete five phase seconds. behind a complete phase behind yeah at 100 hertz five milliseconds you're you're 180 degrees at a phase mm -hmm. so now, five a milliseconds is pretty long and and a and 100 hertz you're probably getting close to some kind of bad things that can happen right so um that's why i say maybe 50 is a good is a good number right now you're 90 degrees at a phase with five milliseconds so when you see in pid toolbox 2.5 right imagine you got 2.5 milliseconds of gyro latency then you've got four, you're 45 degrees at a phase that mm -hmm. means your your gyro signal is 45 degrees at a phase at those prop wash uh frequencies and actually it's more than that because you got to add the gyro native the, filter. yeah that's a, that's about a millisecond so you're actually it's closer to three and a half that's why i always say you know try to get it lower than two milliseconds or so i want to show you some real data this is just a mm -hmm. throttle sweep log mm -hmm. file that i did i'm just going to pick here because at some point you can see this is actually uh in red is is the pre-filtered gyro and in mm -hmm. green is the post filters. You can already see the delay. I'm kind of zoomed in here. I just zoom mm -hmm. out. You can see it's just a. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's some bad oscillation going on there, right? Now let's look at the delay. We can measure the delay by looking at just the. Mark. So we're looking at about four milliseconds delay. And actually, you got to add a millisecond, right? Because remember, this is delayed by one millisecond. Of that. I think that's the, the important part, and people don't uh, really uh, know that. So the pre-filter signal already is delayed because of the gyro internal yeah. physical filter, which makes about one millisecond. So we, we also yeah. always have to add that millisecond. That's right. So, so you have that delay. Now, let me just plot... P is derived from the filter gyro. So this looks good. P is like mm -hmm. pretty much perfectly opposing it, right? In this case, set point is actually zero. Set point is just right there. So uh, so P is the difference between set point and gyro. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be perfectly opposed, right? But that's the post filter gyro. That's not the reality. This is your. This is actually not your your copters actual movement your copter moved okay. mm -hmm. your copter moved before that right we, we showed that from the this is also important part you said it's the post filter gyro it's so the, post the actual gyro signal is is four milliseconds before four. so although it looks perfect always the opposite it's actually not because there is the the filter delays right I, Right, so, have to take so, P, so P is reacting here. P is like right now at this point in time, P is completely, you know, at its maximum point, trying to push in the opposite direction of what it thinks the copter is, mm -hmm. right? But in fact, the copter is actually peaking five milliseconds before. So it's actually mm -hmm. here. But let me just plot it. Let's plot that up. This is one. So... The thin line is the post-filter gyro. That's the gyro that's being used for the PID loop, right? And that's the gyro that the P term is built off of and that the D term is built off. And everything in the PID loop mm -hmm. is built off of this thin 
blue curve, the post-filter gyro, mm -hmm. which is in fact delayed from reality. There is reality, is the dark blue. So while P is over here, you know, pushing at its maximum this way, it, we're already on the, the copter's already starting to slow down and come back and start a reverse direction. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what you'll see then is, you see this sort of asymmetry where they, where they um, overlap. Now both are actually pushing in the same mm -hmm. direction in this case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want your P to be opposing the gyro to get rid of this oscillation. But in fact, but what's it's happening, pushing this time. it's mm -hmm. pushing in the same direction at this point. And again, they're both pushing in the same direction here and down there. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. right. yep. P is pushing in, uh, a, a, in the same direction as it's trying to erase, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when you'd get like a major flyaway. You'll get some pretty crazy stuff, right? And you can see, in fact, that there's something pretty wonky going on with this, too, mm -hmm. as it, it sort of reaches a point yeah. where early and as i'm increasing the throttle it's pretty good lower throttle but then as it as i increase it it's it's kind of a feedback it suddenly loop. kicks in it suddenly somewhere. kicks in really and it starts to cause a kind of feedback loop so it mm -hmm. certainly is it certainly is some kind of positive feedback mm -hmm. happening yeah that was the um, word i was looking for now i'm i'm using I, this example is this kind of extreme where we have four milliseconds of delay i've seen people with up to four milliseconds but that that's kind of not the point i'm using this as an as a as an example log file just so you can see the dynamics of these things mm -hmm. but um uh lost my train of thought again god i'm getting old can't think do you notice that as you get older like uh, yes. early onset <laughs> dementia and you got kids too so. <laughs> no it's just too much in the head at this i think age. it's kids too man they don't you don't sleep yeah. well when you have kids and the thing is this same kind of process is what's happening during prop wash that's what i wanted to point out uh, that's mm -hmm. essentially so why, it's why we get prop wash look at the peak to peak between the p for example we're at 36 mm -hmm. hertz right yeah 140 hertz yeah or let's look mm -hmm. at the any of the peaks it doesn't matter they're all going to be the same thing right so 37 40 hertz. Hertz. yeah so that's your prop wash frequency and and i think the higher your p gains are up the 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 peak to peak will be a little bit faster but overall for a five inch around 40 hertz is typical and so that's why this is the critical place to measure uh to measure latency i think this is where it really matters so what would happen if the latency uh, decreases beyond a certain threshold? Well, as the latency decreases in the ideal world, then if your latency was decreasing, then your P would be perfectly opposing the real gyro signal, and it would and and you it would be squashing it down. And in fact, then you wouldn't get any of this oscillation. It would just be a flat line. So you, you, there's no way to compare that case, right? Because when you got that case where P is perfectly countering uh, the gyro, then would have flat line, huh? then you've solved the problem. The <laughs> oscillation goes away. <laughs> yeah. um, now P, we have to remember there's another delay here. I'm not talking about too. I, I and I know I glossed over this, but I mean, it takes time for the, the that's the response leg of the copper. So, but. And that's why we have Deke, Deke that comes in a little bit earlier to help that out as well, right? So P was just the easier way to describe this. I could get into the D thing as well, but I think it just overcomplicates it. Just for curiosity, let me just plot D in here. Let's see if we can figure all this out. So there is our sort of real gyro signal is the dark, thick green. There's our the gyro signal that's used in the PID loop, the delayed one. And there's D and P. P is red, D is yellow. Now, So now you can see actually that D is actually a little bit earlier. So D is actually pretty well opposed to the actual gyro. Now you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 